you have your Bibles, turn with me, please, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17. And if you're familiar with that portion of Scripture, we're going to talk about a giant this morning for a little bit. Anybody know his name? Goliath. Goliath. I'm going to talk about David a little bit. Not going to get heavy into the story, but we're going to point out some things this morning that want to refresh our memory maybe a little bit and uh, grasp a hold of the perspective we already have. You know, perspective is, it, it involves understanding, it involves experience, it involves in a certain amount of knowledge and wisdom and so forth to have a perspective to know how about certain things. Uh, all of us have enough perspective, if we have any maturity about us at all, we have enough perspective to avoid a lot of harm. Amen. We have enough perspective to, to avoid a lot of harm. Uh, some folks are foolish because they want to be foolish. Some people want to be daring because they want to be daring to see how far they are, or how, how, far, how, how much they can get by with, whatever. But uh, we have enough perspective to know and understand in things in this life. What about in the spiritual world? What about in your spiritual fight? Do you have enough perspective to be able to sustain and not suffer wound or things that we could avoid? Let's pray. Father, thank you again for the kindness and the mercy that you show towards us through Jesus Christ our Lord in that we have life abundant and eternal through him. Thank you, Father, for the privilege we have to be here today to serve you and honor you, worship you in spirit and truth, to fellowship with the saints, to learn of you, to know that truth that you speak of that makes us free, free from bondage, free from all of the ugly things that we've been delivered from because of your love, grace, and mercy. Father, I'm asking that you'd guide my thoughts this morning as I present your word that we hear truth, that we're convinced by your spirit of that power and opportunity and find deliverance in every way to serve you faithfully in this hour, to be an inspiration and light to others that they might find Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Thank you for answered prayer. Thank you for victory. Thank you for blessings experienced and many to come because of your promise. Help us, Lord, to be stay, uh, steadfast, unmovable, abounding in your work uh, for the Lord that your name be honored and your purpose be accomplished. Thank you, Father, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 4. And there went out a champion. Now, this wasn't the run-of-the-mill guy I have some armor on. This was a champion, a big guy, and we're familiar with who he is, not everything about it. But I want to emphasize some things this morning. A champion out of the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. His daddy's name was Gath. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Now, depending on whose cubits that you're using to how, see how tall he is, he's around 10 feet tall. We can guess his weight, we can guess his shoulders, we can guess various things, but somebody that's 10 foot tall is able to have this armor that he's carrying, and we'll talk about that just for a little bit. Uh, he's ruthless. He's to be feared. He's something that's obviously that's going to be a confrontation if you, if you rub in the wrong way. Ten foot ties as high as a basketball goal. I'm guessing his shoulders are at least this wide. I don't know how much he weighs. How much do you think he weighs? 1,200 pounds? Give or take. And Well, let's carry on. And he had a helmet of brass upon his head and his arm with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of brass. And he had uh, greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. He was weighted down like a tank. He was strong and powerful like a tank. You wasn't going to easily take him out. Now, we, he's symbolic of our adversary, the devil. He's symbolic of the world uh, uh, that's confrontational towards our spiritual welfare. His greaves of brass upon his legs and a target of brass between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And his spear had weighed 600 shekels of iron. One bearing a shield went before him. Uh, this weight of the spear on the end of it is like 20 pounds. It's a little challenging just to pick up 20 pounds with your arms stretched out and just lift it up. It's a little challenging. It's easier for others, but you put that on a spear and hold it out there about 6, 8, 12 feet. 
Look how difficult it's going to be. This guy was big. This guy was strong. And he was feared. Israel, all of Israel, this army that we're talking about, was sore afraid, very afraid. And Saul was too. And it goes on talking about a few other things in his armament. And down in uh, verse 12, it says, Now David was a son of Ephrathite of the Bethlehem Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons, and the man went among them for an old man in the days of Saul. And the three eldest sons of Jesse, the eldest of the eight, went to, uh, to the battle with the Israelites and faced the giant. Now, some things about this story that we just kind of look over, don't think anything about. We think about David and his sling, slung, slung stone, and victory, it's over with. Let's focus on the story just for a little bit this morning. David, right after this verse, it's talking about that Jesse uh, sent David to his brethren with some food, with some support, uh, to bless them, strengthen them. And when David got there, he found out that for 40 days... They were at odds against the Philistine army because they had this big champion that was huge, that was ugly, that was fearful, uh, fearless rather, and that they were staunched in their tracks and didn't have any encouragement, anything to go by because they were convinced by what the adversary had said and done. Have you ever been stopped in your tracks, spiritually speaking, because of what the adversary had said and done? I have momentarily. You have, at least momentarily, walking along and all of a sudden there's a snake. You're stopped momentarily until you think, oh yeah, back up or jump. Every one of us are faced with an adversary that wants to steal and kill and destroy and will momentarily react, at least stop, right? Because he gets our attention. When a dog comes charging up, barking at you, he gets your attention. And other things that we notice, somebody crosses the other line, they get your attention. It stops you for a moment until you kind of think what to do, swerve, stop, whatever the case may be. Here the giant came. He got their attention. They were so afraid for a longer time than just a moment. And David delivered the food and the cheese and the bread and so forth and so on. And down in verse 22 it says, And David left his carriage in the hand of the keeper of the carriage and ran into the armor and came and saluted his brethren. And as he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the armies of the Philistines, and spake according to the same words, and David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were sore afraid. That means really, really afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that is come up surely to defy Israel? He is come up, and it shall be that the man who kills him... The king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. All right, now we're getting into some particulars about this story. David was approximately 20 years old. His older son, uh, brother was somewhat older than him because David was the youngest and, and the oldest was the oldest, obviously. And there was three of the older ones there. Now the giant had come out and said what he did and David noticed and he's getting a little... Uh, <clears throat> what would you call it, righteous indignation, that this giant has come out and defied the Israelites and God Almighty? How do you feel in your spirit when somebody starts cursing God, starts defaming the church, speaking against the people that you know are holy and righteous and serving God faithfully? How do you feel inside? Do you feel sheepish and backward when hide? Or is it the opposite? This is challenge. Think about this. How do you respond when God's church is, I'm not talking about this church, the church worldwide, is challenged by ungodly living, ungodly decisions against the church? How does it cause you to feel? What do you do about it because you feel that way? Or do you cower and are sore afraid and don't do anything? It's something to think about, isn't it? Amen. Verse 24 said that they were sore afraid. Now let's read down a little farther. And David, verse 26, spake unto the man that stood by them, saying, What shall be done to the man that kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Do you know it's a reproach when things are said bad against the church? Do you know that it's a reproach when somebody says something bad about your brother and sister you've been praying for? It's a reproach. What do you do about it? How does it make you feel? Does it rile a spiritual indignation in your life that you want to pray and do something right and righteous? Or do you want to hide and keep your mouth shut and walk away? Which is it? 
It's a reality in our lives on a regular basis. We're making those choices one way or the other. We can at least pray. We can at least shout, praise God Almighty for His loving kindness towards me. We can make a choice and do something about it. A reproach from Israel, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after the manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that kills him. Now David's about to make up his mind. In fact, he's probably making up his mind for a good while now to see what he can do about this. He found out about the reward. He found about found out about what people are saying. He found out about this champion. He found out how they're reacting. Now he's starting to get in gear and start thinking about something. But the first thing, at least one of the first things he hears, is something from older brother that was not encouraging. What was the circumstance? And here in a moment, he says, is there not a cause? David says, is there not a cause? Isn't there not a reason to do something about this? Have you ever made up your mind to do something for the Lord? And boom, right off the bat, the devil says, try to put you down. Or boom, right off the bat, a family member or co-worker or something tries to stop you, be in confrontation with you with whatever you have to say or do and trying to go forward and fix a matter that needs to be taken care of. Look what it goes on. Verse 28, Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David and said, Why camest thou down here? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? See, belittled him. All you do, take care of a few sheep. You're up here nosing around, not minding your old business. And the oldest one, <laughs> this is the way he reacted. You would think he would have maturity, experience, Knowledge, capability that he's out there in the first place. That he's out there in the first place. But no, he's reacting in a different way. Those of us that have a measurable amount of maturity and experience needs to realize, don't be like this oldest brother. When things are happening that's out of your control, things are happening that you don't understand, things that happen is that you can't figure out, don't react like this oldest brother. What are you doing out here? You ought to be off doing the puny little thing you're supposed to be doing. Stay here bugging us, trying to see the show. <clears throat> Somebody's toes are being stepped on. All right, we'll carry on. Uh, I know thy pride, he says. And the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art down, come down that thou mightest see the battle. And David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? And he turned from him toward the another, and spake after the same manner. And the people answered him again after the former manner. And when the words were heard which David spake, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. All right, David's about to go before Saul. Saul is the king, the revered one, head and shoulders taller than anybody else around, except for the giant. Oh, except for the giant. Remember back when Saul was chosen. We want him, oh, so forth and so on. We like that, and we want a king. Now they're up against something that Saul himself's afraid of. Didn't matter whether he's a, 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 any taller or anything else. He was just as afraid as anybody else. So David approaches Saul, wants to say, hey, I want to do something about this. Verse 33 says, and Saul said to David, thou art not able. Anybody tell you, you can't do that. Anybody said to you, you ain't worthy. You're not smart enough. You're not educated enough. You're not strong enough. You're not tall enough. You're not whatever enough. Has anybody ever done that for you? How does it cause you to feel? <clears throat> Guess what? The devil tries to do that any time and every time he possibly can that you listen to him. He'll ramble, he'll ramble on with anything he, he wants to, but if you start listening a little bit, oh, he, he, he keys in on that and he emphasizes you can't do that. You can't do that. You can't do that. So-and-so can, but you can't. You can't. This is what the king is telling David, who is about to tell him his experience, and we know what that is. But Saul says, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. Look at the odds. You can't fight this guy. You can't even stand up to him. He's a lot bigger than you. He's a lot meaner than you. And everything else he might have said. Saul simply said, you can't do this. David says, yes, but. <laughs> In so many words. I've killed a lion. I've killed a bear. And this big old giant is nothing. They're nothing compared to what I've already taken care of. And whatever it was, and however that it was that David said this, it convinced the king. 
Whatever you say in the midst of your challenge and how you say it will either convince the right side or not. It'll not convince the right side or not. What you say and how you say it with whatever maturity, experience, and capability that you have with the Spirit and with God Almighty will convince one side or the other by what you say and how you say it. Doesn't mean you have to be foolish. Doesn't mean you have to have a lot of volume, though sometimes you need it. Sometimes you need to keep your yap shut. Be still. That's what it means. Be still. Not just motionless. Be still. And see what God can do. David said, I've killed a bear. I've killed a lion. Uh, verses 34, 35, uh, 36, it says, Thy servants slew both the lion and the bear. Uh, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing hath denied the armies of the living God. David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion, out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. At least one person, at least somebody's going to try. Everybody else hasn't yet. Everybody else hasn't yet. But here's a young man who says, I'm going to do it. I've had proof. I've had experience in my past. I can do this. This is nothing to me. This is nothing for me, especially when the Lord is with me to lead me and guide me. And Saul armed David with his armor, and he put a helmet on brass on his head, and he armed him with his coat of mail. And David girded his sword upon his armor, and he essayed to go, tried to go, for he had not proved it. And David said unto Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not proved them. And David put them off. Saul thought he was going to do a good thing. Saul thought he had some good advice, and frankly, they was good advice. But we know tall, tall Saul was too tall for David. David probably wasn't all that tall. You remember he was a red-faced, really colored kid back when he was tending the sheep, and, and Saul, or Samuel anointed him. He grew up somewhat, but he probably wasn't as tall as Saul. And that was a big reason why Saul's army didn't help David at all. David hadn't used Saul's armor Don't try to be someone else. You're following up what God is trying to develop in you for you, for His glory. We can take note and learn some things, have some experience, do some growth patterns, some training and discipline. But when it comes down to what God wants you to do, He wants you to do it because you can with what He's given you. Amen. David had a sling. He's about to pick up five smooth stones. Now, if you're qualified and disciplined and trained and all that kind of thing, there's certain particulars about how you operate to be able to be successful. You don't grab just any old sling. You don't pick up any old kind of rock. Somebody say amen. Amen. Me and McKenna was down to the river a few days before the baptism. I was down there actually checking things out for the baptism, but I thought I'd take her down there. She would think, oh, we're going to the river. And we did. We got down there, and she says, can you skip a rock across the water? And I said, yeah, I used to. Wasn't able to, too good, but I skipped a little bit. And she kept picking up all kinds of different rocks. And I said, you got to find a flat, smooth one. So whenever you throw it, it lays flat on that water, and it, it skips. There's a certain way to do that and get it accomplished. And those of us that have a reasonable amount of maturity and experience know that already. And know that already about a lot of things because we learn certain things. We've experienced certain things. And we've learned because of those experiences. Some of them brings hard knocks. Some of them are inconvenient. Some of them are kind of embarrassing. Some of them, in fact, all of them are usually not comfortable when we learn things. But David took his sling, uh, verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had even in a script, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Why did he have to get five stones when he just used one to kill the giant? The giant had brothers. The giant had brothers. Oh, yeah, we'll read it here in a minute. Ah, oh, okay. David's weapons was faith in God and the experience that he had already. His confidence was sufficient. I don't know if it was 100%. I don't know if it was overboard. I don't know if people called him or whatever because he thought he was something. But he had sufficient evidence and proof that what he was able to do, that what he was facing would be nothing. And we know the end of the story. All right, let's look at that. 
Verse 45, David said to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. You need to put the devil in a place when it comes time to confront him. You know, when the devil uh, keeps yapping and yapping and bugging and bugging, you need to put, stop in your tracks and turn to him, whether you want to turn to him or not, and say, look, this is how it is. I'm a child of the Most High. I believe in God Almighty. It's going to be this way. You're going to stop defying me. You're going to stop lying to me. You're going to stop coercing me in the name of Jesus. This is how it's going to be and be that way. Guess what will happen? He will stop for a while. That's how we sustain because we confront him. Don't go running around trying to find him so you can confront him. Do it whenever he comes against you. What did Jesus do when the devil confronted him? He said, it is written. This is the way it's going to be. Jesus went on and in time the devil tried again and again and again. The devil's going to keep on trying again and again in our lives. When he does, confront him. Stop in your tracks and say, look, this is the way it's going to be. Proclaim the word of God, the promise of God, the truth of God in the name of Jesus. He'll stop. He has no other choice. He'll stop for a while. He regains his composure and here he comes back again with something else. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Amen. That's how he handles things. That's how he keeps on trying. And if we'll keep doing what we know what we can do because we've had some reasonable amount of experience that we can stand true to God and have confidence in the victory that we can uh, obtain. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine hand from thee, head from thee, and I will give the uh, carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day, the fowls of the air, and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all the assembly shall know that the Lord serveth uh, or saveth not with sword and spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. And that's exactly what he did. He killed the giant with one stone, went up to the giant, cut off his head. Israel was, was thrilled and the Philistines run off. There was a few confrontations that David had. Uh, he was very disappointed that his own brethren and his own army was so afraid of the Philistine army. His own brother falsely accused him of doing what he did, being there, and accused him of what he wasn't actually doing. And the king himself, Saul, said, you can't do this. You can't do this. And he tried. He took his advice and still couldn't do it because he hadn't proved it, hadn't experienced it, hadn't disciplined himself. Saul's armor did not work. But what David could use and could find victory is what he has experienced before in trusting God and believing God and using the name of Jesus Christ in the manner that it was available for him. Now, amen. One other little thing before we go to uh, another spot. After David done this, everybody was so excited. And they complimented David in such a marvelous way that it made Saul so mad. <laughs> so much so that Saul was sought to kill David. When somebody else, especially when you've helped for a while or encouraged for a while, and it doesn't seem like you're making a whole lot of progress, and at some point in time, the Lord blesses them, they have a ministry, whatever, you know, whatever, however God blesses them. And folks are saying, oh, they're so blessed. They're so successful. They have such a ministry. Don't be like Saul and just turn all shades of green and purple and red. And seek to and devise to to ruin that person and their ministry or whatever it is that you're successful for. Amen. Don't be that way. Well, I pray for anybody and help anybody if you're going to be a turncoat in time. I mean, you know what that means? If that's the way you're going to be, that means you really didn't mean what you meant in the first place by supposedly helping and advising and so forth. Possibly, Saul had it in his mind, well, if I can get this sucker to put on my arm and go out there and kill a giant, I'll look better and it's over with. I don't know, just guessing, just words. Okay, turn with me, please, to 2 Samuel. Read a few verses, and then we'll be done shortly after that. 2 Samuel chapter 21. 2 Samuel chapter 21. Back in the sixth chapter of Genesis, we read about giants, a few other giants. Then there was a flood, and all was destroyed except for Noah's family. And, uh, and then in a while, uh, giants 
come back into view. Well, just talking about these few, uh, Goliath and his brethren, and this is just for your information, it doesn't have a whole lot to do uh, with the message. However, with this point, David chose to get five stones instead of just the one. Was David aware of other giants? I suspect that he was. Was other people aware of giants besides Goliath? I suspect so. 2 Samuel chapter 21, verse 15. Moreover, the Philistines had yet war again with Israel, and David went down and his servants with him and fought against the Philistines, and David waxed faint. This was several years after the incident that we were just talking about. And Ishbenab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, and he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zuriai, secured him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. In other words, David was getting to the age that he, his comrade says, You don't need to be out here chasing giants. We'll take care of it for you. Already named one there in verse 16. And it came to pass that after, verse 18, after this, that there, were, uh, there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai the Hushite, slew Saph, there's the second one, which was of the sons of the giant. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines, uh, where Elhanan, the son of Jehoror Ejim, a Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath the Jittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. Remember that? And there was yet a battle in Gath, uh, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand, how many hands did he have? Just two. Had six fingers, and on every foot, just two feet, six toes for four and twenty in number, and he also was born to the giant. And when he had defiled Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimim, uh, Shimea, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. My point in reading these few verses here is to realize that the devil's not going to stop trying. He has more brothers out there, whether you call them giants or not. You remember the verse where uh, uh, when, when a soul is slept, uh, swept and garnished and the evil spirit is taken out of him, that that spirit will go and gather seven more and come back, and if they enter into that individual, they're seven times worse than they were the first place. What do you point? What's the point, Pastor? Pick up more than one stone. Don't just pray once if you're going to face a spiritual battle of whatever sort that it is, thinking that will take care of it. It may for the time being. But there's other things that will most likely crop up and confront you. And if you don't have enough stability, if you don't have enough confidence concerning the bear and the lion that you've already uh, been victor over, if you don't have enough of that, if you're yielded to other people's advice, here, try this, here, try this, it's not likely you're going to uh, make a very good showing. If you listen to the people of their, you can't do it. Why are you doing here? There's no way in the world. If you listen to those things, you're not going to get very far. And anything, and frankly, spiritually speaking, you're not going to get any fair, very very far. Uh, Don't be so moved by people's comments. Don't muster up well they're liable to say or they're liable to be. You know what you're doing? You're already putting a noose around your neck. What do you mean by that? How much progress are you going to make from where you're at right now if you're concerned like that with everything that might happen? Guess what? David took his staff and his sling and his, his stones and ran to the giant. We can run right into the battle regardless of what the devil has to offer, regardless of how many brothers he has or how many uh, cohorts that he has. We don't have to be concerned with that because we're already overcomers. We're already victors in Christ if we don't lose that, if we don't lose that confidence, if we don't set it down somewhere and think we're going to achieve other things in a more efficient way. If you do, it won't be very much. If you do, it won't be for very long. If you do, it won't suffice in time to come. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Acts 1 and 8 says, And you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. 
And if you believe that and you take, in, take that and embrace that, there's no reason for fear. There's no reason for it. If you fall prey to fear, it's because you've forgotten something. Or you've not attributed uh, God's power and authority and His benefit in your life sufficiently. You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. John 14 and 12 says this, Jesus speaking, He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Anybody interested in doing the same works that Jesus done? Absolutely. Absolutely. Father, help me that my mind is stayed on you, that my mind is transformed into spiritual things as, as opposed to carnal things more and more so that I can serve God Almighty as Jesus did, being willing and obedient, being yielded to the Spirit of God, to trust and believe God and serve and represent Him faithfully. It goes on to say, And greater works than these shall He do, because I go unto my Father. Greater works. Now, however you want to measure that, it says Greater. Whether more astounding or more in number, it doesn't really matter. He says, greater works shall you do. Why is that? Because God's not given us the spirit of fear. There's no point in being afraid. Other than the moment. The moment happens. Reality happens for the moment. But we know, we understand, we have enough uh, uh, measurable maturity and perspective to know what to do as opposed to what comes handy. Ah, run off. Amen. A couple more minutes. Ephesians 6, 16 and 17 says this. Talking about the armor of the Spirit, put on the whole armor. It says right this in verse 16, above all, in other words, be sure. Having the shield of faith, that's going to make a difference no matter where you're at, no matter what you're doing. Faith is based on what you're believing, whether you're believing or not. If you believe a thing, you function in the manner of what you're believing, just like we're doing every day. You do what you do because you're believing in that manner or that direction. You have a certain expectation of what you've decided that whatever the outcome is, you're demonstrating by you being faithful. Your behavior. Your behavior. Amen. He that believeth on me, the works that I do shall be done greater, and these shall you do because I go to my Father. He says, above all, Ephesians 6, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able. There ye shall be able. Now, if we didn't read the rest of the verse, it's significant. If we just took to heart what that said is so far. Above all, take the shield of faith so that you be able. That you be able. Put on the whole, whole armor of God that you may be able. That's in Ephesians chapter 6 too. Talking about the armor, the spiritual armor that we to put on. That you may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Any time and every time that our adversary comes against us, roaring, Ten foot tall or whatever, as big or ruthless as whatever he might be or present himself to be with whomever, with whatever circumstance, we don't have to be afraid. Because of the, of, of the shield of faith, he says, above all, taking the shield of faith, of faith wherewith you can quench every fiery dart of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the only offensive weapon, weapon that a child of God can use and be successful. Amen. We might holler and rant and rave and, and carry on carnality and change things momentarily, but when it comes down and all the dust settles, the devil's going to be there looking at you and, and say things like, what are you doing here? You can't do this. You're not big enough. Why are you even trying? All these kind of things. Anybody familiar with those kind of comments? He does them. As soon as anything settles, he'll be right back. How are you going to be able to stand? What are you going to trust in? What experience do you have that would give you any kind of confidence that you can carry on to the next confrontation? We know this story about David and Goliath. It's real. It happened. The reality of the truths that I uh, trust that I was sharing with you today, the Spirit of God is convincing of us of those things. Don't be moved by circumstances. Don't be moved by people. And a lot of times people mean well, but it's not the direction God wants you to go. Maybe not every time, but often it's the case. David tried. He put on Saul's armor. It wasn't, wasn't going to work. This doesn't work. I've not proved this. I haven't tested this. I don't know if it's going to work for me. Do and know and have confidence in what God is developing in you. Or he wouldn't have been started in the first place. He wouldn't have started that good work in you if he didn't know something good's going to come from it. Amen. Trust in God, for he is tr uh, worthy of our uh, confidence and worship. There's no reason to be afraid of any giants of any kind. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. May the Lord richly bless you. Take to heart the truth you heard.
Take to heart what the Spirit has told you this morning and spoke to you. Whether it's something I said or not, that part doesn't matter. But you heard truth because I read from the Scripture. We heard truth because we've heard and recognized examples in the Bible of reality of which we're familiar with. This encouragement this morning is to know and realize, though we've defeated the devil one moment, a few moments later, a day or two later, whatever the case may be, he'll be back. That's his ruthless, uncaring, sleething, is that a word? <clears throat> Ugly way of doing things. <laughs> that it's going to stop one of these days. And let's be on the right side of the fence. Let's be prepared that when the trumpet sounds, and it's going to, that point in time is coming very soon. Uh, it's been treated as a cliche. It's been treated, oh, I've heard that all my life. But the reality, it's closer now than what it was before. Be prepared and ready. Should the trumpet sound that your soul is right with God, your spirit is right with God, and you have your passions, your carnal passions under control. Because when they get out of control, they taint what God is trying to build. Anyone need prayer today? You have a particular need you'd like the church to pray with you about? 